Hello and welcome to The Great Revel, I'm your host Poseidon and today we have a lot to talk about. Um, as there were, at the end of last week there were a couple of things that um, got my attention so I want to discuss them here. Um, uh, so first and foremost, there was a lot of, there were a lot of people uh, giving their Hot, hot takes on Urza's saga. Not the set, the card. Um, and, wow. Um, I don't even know where to begin. So, I think, I, think, I think all the conversation started with a thread where someone was like, Oh, uh, Urza's saga, Urza saga is real strong everywhere, but it's only really broken on Amulet Titan, so maybe let's ban uh, Primeval Titan. And it wasn't a single post by anyone on anywhere. It was just how the conversation came to be, I think. Uh, so people people were, were, were commenting that, yes, Urza Saga is very strong, but it brought um, Affinity back. And, and boys, bo- I, I, don't know, I don't know what is it with Affinity players. God bless them. But God damn it, do they love their deck only when it's playing broken cards. I cannot, I cannot understand what it is with Affinity players. Look, Mox Opal was absolutely busted. It was a rainbow Mox, but only for very specific decks. And that's broken. That's absolutely broken. And if you don't agree that it's broken, then it's because you're playing the deck. It's either because you're playing the deck or because you have a good matchup against that deck. Um, But I think that if you look at it objectively... Uh, you know, with your frontal lobe, you'll, rea- you'll realize that the card is inherently broken. Um, fast man is very dangerous, and when you put uh, such a non-restriction on a moxen, uh, you you end up with a, with a card that's too good. And sure, it wasn't it wasn't banned because Affinity was abusing it. Although although every Affinity shell was abusing it, the rest of the deck was kind of so bad that um, it never really warranted any action. Sure, this was after, uh, or rather, this was because the artifact lands were not legal, this was because uh, shit like, I don't know. There there were a lot of of artifacts that were banned um, before I even started playing modern. I think they were banned from the get-go, I'm not sure. But I I know that there are a lot of banned artifacts, and that's because artifact the artifact type is apparently very easy to break. Um, and here we go again. Uh, it's being, well, I wouldn't, I maybe wouldn't say broken, but it's being pushed by a card that's not even an artifact. Um, although, okay, Urza Saga is very strong. I'm not denying that. Um, I'm not sure if it's broken levels of strong. Uh, which means to say, I'm not sure if it's a card that warrants any action, because there's some strong hate against it. Um, and there's hate against it in 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 pretty much every color. I think I think maybe not white because you know white, but like blue. Blue decks can play spreading seas, which is a valid uh, land hate card. It cantrips, it kills Tron, it kind of kills Amulet. Um, maybe more now that it hits Urza Saga. Uh, Red has Alpine Moon. Um, not to mention the classic Blood Moon. Black has the the new land hate card that destroys land for two. And Green has a whole plethora of enchantment hate that's very versatile meaning that you can uh, out-tempo uh, an Urza Saga with those options so I don't think that Urza Saga will be as pushed as Field of the Dead for example because Urza Saga being hit by a whole new type of hate means that it might just not be um, that hard to interact with um, and a lot I know that a lot of the answers that I mentioned also hit Field of the Dead. 
Uh, but the red ones in this case uh, hit not only uh, the Urza Sagrets on the battlefield, but any future ones, which I think is very relevant. Um, either way, uh, Urza Saga, very good. I do not think it's broken. But what, what really got me, what really got me, wasn't uh, Affinity players wanting to keep the card legal. It was when people started to 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 look towards primeval titan as a banning option because quote unquote it's been in it's been it's been broken many times in the last two years so maybe it is the problem and ooh I don't even know okay so here's the thing here's the thing primeval titan the card is very strong uh, and that's because it's a ramp payoff. So it's something you cast after ramping that enables itself. It's very weird because it's a ramp payoff, but it 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 gives you other payoffs, um, and that and that can be dangerous because if your ramp payoff uh, generates other payoffs, um, and the deck does play like eight plus two or three primeval titans. Uh, so you pretty much always have it. Which means that the deck is somewhat consistent. I do think that Primeval Titan still... The deck isn't broken. The only reason that the deck isn't broken is because it lacks consistency. And like, for every, for, for every Primeval Titan that kills you on turn 2... There are like five or six that don't kill you on turn five, which I think, which I think it's, which I think is fair to say, um, which I think it's, which I think it's pretty fair to say. Uh, my point is that <laughs> this kind of got away from me, but my point is, Primeval Titan is strong. Um, I would, but I wouldn't necessarily say. So here's 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 why you would ever ever even consider banning Primeval Titan. It would be because it's restricting uh, land design space, right? Like, you look you look at Primeval Titan and say, oh, it abused the heck out of, of Field of the Dead. Oh, it's abusing the heck out of Valakut. The thing is, Field of the Dead was abused by a lot of things. Um... Pretty much, your 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 control deck play three colors. Yep, stick Field of the Dead in there and just win the game off of that. Uh, and it pushed pretty much every other every other non aggro non combo deck out of the format. People like to point at Uro and say that Uro was the problem. Uh, and that's a whole other conversation. But honestly, I think Uro without Mystic uh, Mystic Sanctuary and Field of the Dead would be a fine modern card. Um, but but that but that's beyond the point. What I mean to say is that yes, Primeval T Titan could maybe uh, restrict um, win cons on lands, but I think that the the whole concept of having a win con on a land is pretty broken already. Because if you look at Field of the Dead, the card read like straight garbage. Um, for real, if you if you look at the card. It looks hard to enable. Um, it's slow. Uh, it, com it, it comes in tapped. Doesn't generate colored mana. It's it's very very clunky. It's very clunky for a card. However, turns out that when your win con can be used early, um, or, or let me let me put this in in bullet points at least in my head before I get lost. It's hard to disrupt, so it's easy to cast um, and hard to disrupt, be it, be it from hand hate, counter spells, whatever. It has use early on. You can play it early on as a tapped land when you have on your turn one, if you're on play, or if you don't have a turn one play, or like as your fifth land, uh, just to keep uh, open mana for anything else. Uh, and yeah, that's it. That's pretty much it. If your if your if your win con is just not something you you have to um, sink resources into, then it just 
It's just too free not to run, right? And the, the reason that Valakut isn't, um, isn't a widespread win con, it's because it needs a second card to really hit hard, be it Dryad or, um, I don't know what it is. The, 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 the enchantment that's, that's half a Dryad. Like, it, it, it gives your lands all typings. Now, needing that second card, which you need to spend mana on, and is vulnerable to, 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 uh, to more common hate because enchantment hate isn't something people really pack, but it's something that's naturally there because a lot of artifact answers also answer enchantments. Almost all of them, sadly, Smash Smithereens doesn't. But uh, I think that it, 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 it that's, that's why Valakut isn't like in every control deck, basically. But basically, that's what I'm saying. But if you want to design cards, of the caliber of Field of the Dead, which, again, I think the card itself uh, is pretty much the worst win con on a land that you could make. Uh, not worst, because, you know, man lands exist, but the worst in terms of, um, like, slow but steady win cons. I think, I think, I think Field of the Dead was, was, was up there with worse, um, Worst text, and it was still broken. Uh, so my conclusion here really is that you can't really print win cons on lands. If Field of the Dead taught us anything, is that you can't print win cons on lands. Urza Saga diverges from this a little bit because it's also an enchantment. It's vulnerable to other uh, other kind of hate, and being a saga mean that means that some hate is it really hard. Um, but. What I what I mean to say here is that if you can't really print cards like Field of the Dead, then Primeval Titan isn't really restricting anything. Uh, so even suggesting banning Primeval Titan is 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 you know is just insane. Um, I think that if you if you if you want to nerf the deck, which which could be a fair point, could be a fair point. I think you you ban Dryad. I think Dryad. Um, by the way, I'm not suggesting uh, uh, in any way a banning of Dryad. I think that Primeval Titan right now isn't too strong. But I do think that if if you even want to bring the conversation uh, of banning a Titan piece, it's either Dryad, because Dryad is what made the deck less. Um, I don't even know how to say this. Um, it made the deck less... Uh, do I want to say linear? I don't want to say linear because it made the deck more linear. Um, that kind of depends on the on your definition of linear. But it made the deck not depend on combat, which, you know, was exploitable. Um, uh, for example, us as burn players. If, if you're hearing this as a burn player... You you could you could pack in the flecking palm and it was a very strong tool because uh, they didn't have they didn't really have a way to beat you fast without attacking with Titan and I think I think this contributed to the downfall of the flecking palm in my sideboards is that it doesn't do anything against Amulet Titan right. Um, Sure, nowadays it probably does because they're not expecting it because nobody is really playing the flag and palm. Or rather, they shouldn't. Uh, I still see some copies from now and then, but they really shouldn't. And they can just Valakut you out of the game, uh, which, is typically, which is typically how you lose. Um, is they have... They have the, the three pieces, right? They have Amulet, they have Dryad, they have Titan, then... It's just an instant kill, even if you helix him once or twice. That's that's why I that's why I I I, I think that the best way of beating Titan is either a denying them them their triggers with Strict Proctor or b killing uh, Amulet or Dryad, uh, which is which is which was why I was kind of high on Rip Apart uh, before Modern Horizons two because. Uh, sure, the card, you know, paying two mana to kill either one is not amazing, but uh, it had enough targets that it was it was never really a dead draw, which I think is very relevant in that matchup. You don't want dead draws. 
Um, so yeah, I do think that if you ever want to bring the conversation of banning something from Titan, it's dried. Or, or Pact, you know, Pact is, is, is just extra copies of any green card you want. Um, and Eladamri Skull is fine because it costs mana, and I think tutoring something should cost mana uh, beforehand, not after the fact. Um, so you could also potentially look at at Summoner's Pack and say, yeah, this this one's kind of the 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 um, this card's the one at fault because it just adds a ton of consistency. And I do think that if you want to hurt Primeval Titan, you don't cut the head. Um, you just cut some consistency because the deck does lose to itself the most. Because um, nowadays it's more like a combo deck. Let's not fool ourselves. And combo decks having that fail rate is what keeps them at bay. Uh, so 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 yeah, that's that's that 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 was something that really I don't I don't I don't even I don't even want to say bother me because it really didn't. I don't have I don't have a horse in this race. They banned Primeval Titan. Uh, I think it's not healthy for the format, but sure as hell is healthy for me. Um, if they ban Urza Saga, uh, I won't really care much. Um, if they ban anything from, from Amulet, I also won't really care much. But that's not even on the table. Uh, that's not even on the table at this point. I think that if they do want to have some... if if Let me rephrase that. If Urza Saga ends up being broken, which I don't think it is right now, or rather, I don't think it's showing to be broken. I, like, I don't think that you, if you look at challenges, you can say, oh, Urza Saga is very strong. It's like, yeah, Urza Saga is a good card, uh, but I don't think it, it, it warrants any action. Um, so yeah, let's leave it at that. I don't think that it warrants any action for now. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about was and this is more of a a, 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 a a people versus the the company thing. Uh, so Wizards of the Coast recently announced that they would be cutting their their world's price pool by seventy five percent. So it was previously uh, one mil, one million, and now it's two fifty k. And people were mad about it, and and it's it's reasonable to be mad about it because if you're if you're a, an aspiring pro player or an already established pro player uh, of Magic the Gathering, it really hurts when you're when you see the 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 the, the top tournament just being gutted like that. But I think I honestly don't know how. How wizards, or maybe even Asbro, are, are 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 thinking? I don't I don't know how they want to manage their their upper tournament scene. I do think that what they were doing was not working. Because here's here's the problem with 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 pro magic. You can't, or you shouldn't, really uh, pander to casual play right and and i think they do this a lot i think they pander to casual play and that's pretty that's pretty clear when you're when you're when your big tournament formats are standard and historic i think i uh, and, and sure sure covid happened so you kind of had to turn into digital and arguably magic online can be hard to look at. Um, personally, I think it's even harder to look at at Arena because, wow. But um, Magic Online's kind of outdated, and um, it's it's not really the the best tool to show to bring people into the game. Uh, I'd say there's there's a simple fix: uh, work on Magic Online a bit more, um, make it look better. Uh, without sacrificing performance, I'd say. Uh, but <laughs> the platform isn't exactly performing at light speed either way. Uh, so maybe work on the platform a bit more and make your pro play uh, focus towards seasoned players. Because if you, if you pick up any, any good, any popular, any strong player... 
and it's unlikely that they'll prefer standard. And I, and I say this with some confidence because standard, you know, everybody loves the standard that they started to play in or something close because it's their, it, it's how you got into the game, right? It's very probable that you got into the game into X standard format. And when people say, oh, this standard sucks, X standard format was the shit. It's like, yeah, sure, because that's when you started playing. So that's how you, you that, that's from when you have fond memories of like starting to play, starting to get into the game. Uh, but I think that most competitive players would prefer a non-rotating format. Um, from vintage to pioneer, I think I think you should um, I think you should look into all of those formats and make uh, tournaments uh, make tournaments with those. Um, maybe not maybe not pile them all together. You know, um, maybe separate them. Maybe have a um, I don't know, maybe have a, a vintage circuit, a legacy circuit, a modern circuit, and a pioneer circuit. Um, make qualifiers online, make qualifiers in paper, make a whole thing about each format, culminating in a world championship with a hefty prize, and you will see that things probably run a bit better. Um because I honestly think that if you, because here's the thing, here's the thing, if you if you jump between formats and pander to standard, oh and and sure, draft and limited should should also be a, a, a section here. Heck, make standard a section here. I, I just don't think that you should only uh, look at standard uh, now historic, which I think is a mess of a format, and and limited, right? Because these non-rotating formats, typically, and I do say typically, they have the 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 most competitive players, uh, and and that's very easy to see. If you go to your to your to your local game store for a Friday night Magic event, standard will probably have some tiered strategies, but it will probably have it will probably also have some somewhat janky strategies um whereas if you if you sign up for modern you'll probably see more uh tiered strategies more people you know really somewhat capable with their decks and this is not in every store of course i know i know i know that there are some stores that don't really have a big uh competitive uh, uh pod of players but i do think that it's easier to find a competitive pod of players uh, that focus on non-rotating format. Having said that, um, who knows? Who knows if this would be the the, the solution? Uh, I'm I'm obviously not claiming that my solution would be correct, but I do think that you shouldn't. Again, just to re reiterate my point, you shouldn't focus on standard so much. Um, I get I get I get that that's the 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 the, the marketing. Um, that's the marketing of, of, that's the marketing part of the tournaments. If you focus on standard, more people will want to play standard. But I think that's a fallacy because I, I don't think that the typical standard FNMer will even care about pro play. That's the thing, right? Because I think that, I think that the people behind those decisions think that the players that are starting out will be captivated by seeing um, a world tournament where you play standard. And then, and then they can say in the broadcast, go to your local game store and learn how to play standard. It's like a whole thing. No, not really. I think that's, that's just <laughs> low-key, um, it's low-key smooth-brained to even think that. Um, Obviously, nobody's gonna, nobody's even gonna have a way to look at those tournaments if they're not already an enfranchised player. And uh, I think that statistically, the players that are that would be more likely to look at those tournaments are players that play again non-rotating formats. So I think that I think that's the direction they should go. 
Um, so yeah, uh, that's my take on the whole. Uh, it took a bit of a tangent on the whole cutting the world's uh, price support, but I think that cutting of the world's price support comes from, you know, a lack of interest from 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 people. I, I sure as heck don't really tune into any center tournaments because it's to me it's boring. I prefer higher power magic. Uh, I would I would tune into modern. I would probably even tune into pioneer. I would probably even tune into legacy and vintage, just because I'm not a fan of playing those formats, but I do find them interesting, and I would watch the heck out of that. Are you kidding me? Uh, imagine like a world championship uh, where like day one it's the modern circuit, day two it's the pioneer circuit, then the the following weekend. It's the vintage and legacy circuits, and you like at the end you have like four world champions, each of their category, and heck, and 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 the uh, sure the following weekend you have draft and limited, and then you could even pit them against each other, right? You could like have a a a, a, fu- a big final, pitting them against each other, uh, in a weird mixed uh, tournament. Um, Although it could feel kind of unfair because it would have to be played in a format, that's why I don't love that idea. But it it could be like a a a post a post tournament thing, like just a fun event for for the winners. Um, but I do think that it would be far more popular to include those formats. And having said that. Having said that, I want to look at the the now 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 let's look now let's go into our 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 our, our regular uh, our regular um, uh, segment, which is looking at challenge results because Modern had two challenges this weekend, and the sudden, uh, the results of the Sunday challenge still aren't out for me. Um, they'll they'll probably be out when. This episode comes out, but I can't see them now. I do have the top eight, which is also what what I typically look into. Even though, again, I know it's not the best way to 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 look at a meta, to look to simply look at the top eight. Uh, but the meta right now is very wide. It's very it's very wild westy here. Um, so I'm just looking at the top eight to see what placed essentially. And because inherently, people uh, people go towards decks that won or at least placed in the top eight. So I think that these results do influence what the the meta will look like. On Saturday, we had is it Asmo Urza winning? And this deck list is just a pile of grindy cards. It plays the. As Moreno, Mardika, Destina, Kuldakar package of, you know, uh, what is it? You play some Street Wraith to be able to cast her. He plays Daredevil, so you have a recurring discard target. And he plays the Cookbook to generate food to use her uh, as a removal uh, piece. And this is what I thought this card would be played as. I When I first saw this card, I thought... This is a very strong card, and I think it could play some decks because you play it, and like you have Seasoned Pyromancer, you have Bloodbraid Elf to hit it, um, you have some, you have some tools to cast this without um, without really morphing your deck too much around it, and the the removal side of it is kind of good because you can just pack up on cookbooks, and if you draw cards that you don't want to draw, like lands or uh, early game cards that you don't really need anymore, you can use them to generate removal. And that's exactly what this deck is doing. And then it's playing a a Urza. Uh, it's playing that in conjunction with the Urza package of Urza, Emery. Uh, it's playing some Thought Monitors, which I think is very interesting. It's a It's a flying beater that has card advantage attached to it, so the card's actually quite solid. And then plays the whole the whole caboodle of 
artifacts for Emery to abuse, and it's playing obviously Urza Saga because it just goes very well with that. I don't think this deck is necessarily abu quote unquote abusing anything, so it's not it's not pushing uh, it's not pushing every one of these new cards um, like to 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 absolutely warp them, but I think it's using them uh, pretty well. It's an interesting deck. From our and I'm and I'm and I'm going into a bit more detail here because it's technically a new deck. We hadn't seen this one, and um, I do think that our matchup against this is probably about even. Like they're they're their non food starts are very easy to beat in my opinion and even their food starts uh aren't that amazing although four cookbook and three oval chase daredevils will probably be will probably be impossible to beat game 1 unless you have a really consistent opener uh, but then game two, you can bring in some rest in peace too, because you you not only nerf Emery, you also nerf the whole cookbook strategy, and you can bring in you know Vortex to 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 be annoying, because they do play they even play some free spells that Vortex could hit, and I think I think that post sideboard you're most likely. I think you're you you have the advantage post sideboard. I think that's cool. And then we have this is the Saturday challenge. Yes. Then we have Amulet Titan. Nothing new here. We have Jeskai Stoneblade, which appeared last challenge or last week, and it's playing um, Ragavan, which I genuinely cannot. Thing. Can I genuinely cannot believe that it's correct? Uh, I get that the card is good, but the issue with the card like Ragavan, and sure, playing it alongside Stoneforge Mystic does make sense because both are high priority targets. Or maybe, maybe I'm convincing myself that it's actually not that bad because if you're playing this many priority targets, uh, hitting even two um, can be a game changer. Um, but I've never really liked Stoneforge decks to begin with in control shells because I think that, and feel free to hate me on this take, but I do think that control players are bad at playing Stoneforge Mystic because. They cast it as soon as they can instead of taking the game into consideration, which makes which makes the card perform much much worse than it would otherwise. If you're a if you're a control player, you're playing against a deck that you know has a lot of removal. You don't play Stoneforge Stoneforge Mystic on turn two ever. You wait it out. You wait it out to a point where you know you can go Stoneforge Mystic, have protection up, untap, and flash in the equipment. That's how you play the card in matchups where your opponent where your opponent is putting pressure on the field or and or on you. Um, but as long as they don't figure that out, I think I think our life's easier as as at least mine as a burn player. Then we had a Delver deck which weirdly enough I like. It's playing for Delver, for for Darcy, and for Murktide Red Regent. Um which in my opinion is a very solid uh Delver package. And yes, I know that Regent and Chandler uh, or Darcy are they 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 don't really function well alongside each other, but I think they do function well uh as like payoffs for filling the graveyard early. And I think that's I think that's the 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 reason they're being played together. And I also think the worst card here is Delver of Secrets. Uh, hard to flip. I think it, I think should be enough reason to to not wanting to play it. And you know, uh, in modern because there's no days, there's no force of will. You kinda can protect your Delvers. Which means you have to play a, 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 a wider, a wider creature package, meaning that Delver gets worse. It's a whole mess. Don't play Delver. Uh, and then we in fifth place, 
we have what is this is this jeskai or teamer or four color this is four color velomakus lorehold uh which is essentially a control deck a, fa a four color control deck that's when to cast indomitable creativity on a dwarven mind token to to poop out a big dragon and that dragon attacks uh, because as ace attacks right away and finds time warp and you do it again and you do it again and you do it again although i'm not sure if this strategy is is as good in modern as it is in historic because removal in modern I think is better. Um, namely, and, and sure, sure, Path to Exile isn't necessarily popular right now. But I do think that if, if, if Through the Bridge didn't break the meta, this one also won't. That's, that's, uh, Through the Bridge was good, but dealing with an Emrakul is harder than dealing with this dragon. Although this dragon can be very strong. This dragon can be very strong. Creativ creativity costs like 4 mana. Uh, so you could potentially do it while holding up like a Remand. Uh, or a Counterspell that this deck does not play. Huh. Um... Oh, it plays four saver at the moment, meaning that your your dragon is definitely gonna hit extra turns. So it's just a turns deck. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, it's playing green for. I don't think it, I don't think that the sideboard veil of summers are. Well, sure. I guess I guess that the, a deck like this would want to play veil of summer because it does nullify. Uh, fatal push on the token and counter spells on the creativity. So sure, sure, it's it's fair. It's also playing for Ren and Six, which is, which is, which I just think it's ass. I think Ren and Six is a control card. I think Ren and Six can maybe be used as a one-two flex slot in mid range when you when when the meta is spe specifically grindy um, and nothing else. I think that playing this in a combo deck is just insane. I think you're shooting yourself in the foot by playing four Ren and six in a combo deck, um, but you know you you made fifth in your in your challenge, uh, which honestly I think and, and and let me let me let me go a little bit on a tangent here. People don't value themselves enough in 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 the magic world, at least in the modern world. I don't know I don't know other formats, but I know for a fact that this person. Uh, was like, oh, this deck's absolutely cracked. And here's my counter argument: this deck is not optimally bu built because you're playing four red and six, and it's bad in this shell. Um, and sure, yada yada. Oh, but it's good if you like if you don't find your dragons, or if you they kill your dragons, you have another threat. Red and six is not a threat. Okay, red and six is mana fixing, uh, or, or yeah, red and six draws you a card per turn, kinda. And it has the upside of dealing with with little creatures. That's why I think it's a, a a great control tool because drawing a land in control is drawing a card. Drawing a land in combo kinda is not really drawing a card. Uh, so yeah, um, I I think that if if uh, what was my point here? Oh yeah, so. I think this person is making made the good result despite of playing a non-optimal build, which I think goes to show that it's a good player. Um, uh, and and I think that people don't value that enough. They usually point at the list and say, "Look, this good," and it's like, "No, you good." <laughs> a list kind of crappy. Um, but yeah, I, I digress. And then in sixth we had uh, blue black uh, Asmo Urza. A different flavor from the previous version. I just think that uh, because Asmo is a, 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 is a hybrid card, you can splash either or in your Urza decks and have like a, a value grindy deck. Um, which is, I, I I think the deck is interesting, uh, and you know, seeing Urza again uh, makes me feel things. Maybe maybe not all good things, but I think the card is. I think, and I've said this, every, every, whenever whenever anyone points at Urza and says, 
Oh, this got my Mox Opal banned. I said, shut the fuck up. Mox Opal got itself banned. Urza is a very interesting card. And I do like seeing interesting cards being played. Uh, so that's that. That's it. In 7th, we had uh, Ponza. Uh, specifically, and this, this version is wild. It's playing 4 Karn. Uh, everything good so far. It's playing 2 Gorilla Shaman. Um... Okay, weird flex. It's playing for pillage, uh, which is you know one more than the typical uh, value. And it's playing three main deck liquid metal coating, which is like oh, so you're so you're like a a, a weird prisony deck. And then it's playing two abrades to you know pay off on that. And it's playing two Trinosphere because if you know if you keep your opponent below three lands, then Trinosphere just says your opponent can't cast spells. It's cute. Uh, it's cute. Again, I don't think it's. I don't think it's like. Um, at least I don't think it's more uh, consistent than your typical typical Ponza lists. Meaning that again, I think this player made the results despite of the list. Although, although I will say this list is just. Very creative. It's a very creative list. It's a very innovative list, um, which does win a lot of points. You know, if your opponent is just throwing curveballs at you left and right, you're gonna you're gonna feel overwhelmed, and that 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 is relevant for winning games. And then in eighth, we have another Velomak who turns back. Uh, same list, if I'm looking at this correctly. So probably uh, the two players know each other and share lists. Again, made the results despite of, not because of uh, the list, because I do think that the list isn't particularly uh, solid. Like, sideboard's kind of a mess. Mainboard has is playing some non not great cards for the plan. And... Yeah, and that was the Saturday challenge. Very interesting, honestly. Um, two Asma Urza, two Velo Marcus turns, and then the rest of the of the decks were, you know, uh, pretty well, uh, pretty well uh, distributed. You have Amulet Titan as a as a big mana deck. You have Stoneblade as a mid range deck. You have Delver as like maybe an a more aggro deck. You have Ponza as another mid-range deck. Um, notably, aggro's maybe uh, a little weaker, but I do think that it's because aggro didn't really get, like, a lot of tools. Sure, Darcy is good, but our Darcy is good in about, in pretty much about everything. Um, so I do think that aggro is missing, mostly because it didn't get any new tools. I do think that, for example, uh, shadow decks are very strong, but people just aren't playing them because they didn't get anything new. Why would they play them? And then on Sunday, I only have the top eight. I don't have lists, so I'll just comment on the whole top eight uh, archetypes. Uh, in first winning, we have Blue Red Pro uh, Blue Red Prowess, yes. And there it is. I predicted that it would win a challenge last week, but it took an extra week. And I do think that a lot of these um, current brews are very soft to big flyers and fast decks. And, Plu and, and, and Prowess hits both marks, uh, so it makes sense that it would win. And then in second place we have Yogmoth, um, which, you know, got a single card in, in Modern Horizon Sue, but it's a single, it's a single big truck. It's a monster truck of a card. It does pretty much everything the deck would want. Um, it's 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 fetchable. It's a fetchable control card, um, which I think the deck kind of needed because it could only really fetch. Um, it could only really fetch combo pieces, and I think this version is also playing the new squirrel combo, which is there's a new card from Modern Horizons Two that makes a token. Whenever a, a, a another creature, and it, it it's a two card combo that makes infinite tokens. Um, it makes infinite swirls. I don't have on hand what the combo is, but um, it's cute. It's like a, a adding another infinite combo to the deck, which I think it's very cool. 
And in third, we had Blue Red Delver, which I will assume is a similar list to the one uh, on on Saturday. Um, again, I think that Delver might be the weakest creature, but it might just be enough to pull through. Then in fourth, we had Amulet Titan, probably nothing new there. In fifth, we had a uh, Mono White Hammer with Luris, meaning no 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 big uh, new enchant and no big new artifacts. Probably playing Urza Saga because again. Um, it's kind of shoe in it does everything the deck wants, it fetches their hammers, it creates creatures to hold hammers, uh, so the only thing it doesn't do is making those hammers easier to hold, um, but it makes sense that people would be picking up this deck list again. And then we had Blue Red Asmo, uh, I'm assuming it's also playing Urza, because, you know, that's the whole, that's the whole reason to sustain Blue Red. Um... Then in 7th, we had Eldrazi Tron, so <laughs> some dude just went, oh, I'm gonna play Eldrazi Tron, and yeah, he, he made top top 8. And then in 8th, we had Jeskai Stoneblade, I'm assuming the Ragavan list, which live, I've con well, not live, because this isn't live, but like, while recording, I've convinced myself that maybe Ragavan isn't that uh, wrong in this deck list. Um, overall, looks pretty healthy, we have aggro, we have combo, we have value... Um, yeah, and I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm and I'm calling Amulet Titan combo, um, which is you know it's it's between combo and big mana, so I think that's fine. Uh, but this top eight looks very healthy. Obviously, it's playing a ton of new cards, uh, but don't let that fool you. New cards came out. A lot of them are interesting and strong enough to 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 consider. So people are playing them and if people if everyone is playing new cards obviously new cards will make the tops uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, a deck that that's entirely made of pre modernizing two cards will be unplayable it just means that people aren't playing them because they're more excited about the new cards um so yeah meta looks very healthy and I would like to comment a little bit on what list I've been playing and what list I will be playing uh, going forward this week. Uh, so last week I I I I I I, I kind of built a sideboard while making the podcast, but upon testing, it wasn't really doing all that well. So right now. My sideboard look, and I posted this on Twitter, but you know, Twitter is kind of a, a cancer. So let me let me go over it again. Uh, my main board, uh, tried and tested, uh, not playing Eidolon right now because I still think that Eidolon's not amazing, um, and and I think I think that's fair to say. A, a lot of the decks that I mentioned uh, play, you know. Not awful. They they play kind of well into Eidolon. Even the Urza decks that would have trouble dealing with Eidolon, they're playing a lot. And I think and I think that's part of why I don't like Eidolon as much right now. I do say right now because it's one of my favorite cards. And if there's ever a chance um, to bring it back in, I will try it out. Um, but a lot of decks are playing. Fuck ton of removal because uh, there's monkeys around, there's still prowess creatures around, there's titans around. People are ready for those. And if people are ready for those, um, I don't think that Eidolon can ever break parity on its effect. Because because Eidolon's good if it's attacking. Uh, well, Eidolon's good if it's hitting someone. Uh, because that's how you make Eidolon not be really symmetrical. Because our entire deck triggers Eidolon. So we kind of have to break that parity somewhere, and it's on attacks. But every deck is just ready to deal with board pressure, ready to deal with annoying creatures. So th that's why I swapped to Flame Rift, because Flame Rift is right. No, shut up, I pay two mana, we both take uh, four. So it doesn't break parity by itself, but the rest of the deck does help break that parity. And Flame Rift just, put, just, just, just pushes us both closer to dying, uh, which I think is uh, good. Um, and, 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 and as for the sideboard, as for the sideboard... Um, actually, okay, so main board is... 
main board is Four Goblin Guide for Monastery Swift Pier as our creature package, then four Lava Spike for Lightning Bolt for Skewer the Critics as our bolts. Um, only playing three Rift Bolts to fit in everything I want as three ofs. Then playing four Flame Rift for Boros Charm because four damage for two mana goes burr. Uh, and then three Skull Crack, Searing Blaze, and Lightning Helix to top it off. In the side, we have three Path to Exile, which I'm. This is probably the this is the card that I would be mo I would be more likely to cut if I need a space for anything else. Although since enchantment decks didn't really make a a, a boom this weekend, uh, I'm 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 you know more relaxed about not preparing against enchantments, which are super annoying, but not that present, so I don't have to worry as much. Um, but as I was saying, Path to Exile. I'm still playing it because you know it's it's easily the best single pip single single mana removal card that we could be playing that hits about everything. Um, but I do think that if you need space for anything that you really want, I, 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 right now because there's no pro red creatures running around, I would cut path. Um, then rest in peace, really good at dealing with Asmo decks, really good at dealing with living in decks, really good at dealing with everything that wants to take advantage out of the graveyard, uh, maybe barring control. Then Strict Proctor, I still think it's a very good card to run, it deals with everything ETB, which is a, a very weak point of burn, and also takes care of Amulet Titan, like, it's very hard for them to win a game after you resolve Strict Proctor, uh, their answers aren't exactly amazing, it's either... Engineer Explosives, if they did bring it in, um, which you know it's not always certain because it does break their amulets if they if 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 they want to cast it early. Um, although I don't think that's that's a reason to not bring them in, uh, but you know it can be a mana intensive card, so there's 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 room there for it to not be amazing. Um, Roiling Vortex because hating on life gain is important. Specifically, Rolling Vortex is good against the Turns deck, which will probably still be somewhat popular, uh, because they, they, they can't cast free spells from the dragon if you have Vortex on. Um, but it's also just a good piece to have on the board to play against uh, food decks, because, you know, it's slowly taking them down, and they kind of can't eat food, um, unless they hold up a bunch of mana and just eat a lot of it. Um, then you're still probably probably denying a couple of, of 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 those, and you know you have mana to deal them. It's a good card against food, essentially. And then smash the smithereens because I do think that artifacts are well, maybe honestly, honestly, maybe it's time to go back to rip apart. Now, with with a lot of Urza decks making tops, I, I I would keep on Smash Smithereens. Yeah, I think Smash Smithereens is the right call right now. So again, three of each path to exile, rest in peace, Strict Proctor, Roiling Vortex, and Smash the Smithereens. This is my list for this week. And last week it went kind of fine. Uh, the stream league was kind of a disaster. But in my defense, I ran into Enchantress into Amulet Titan, which you know are hard matchups, and Strict Proctor. Helps against Amulet Titan, but doesn't make it a, a, a sure win. I think I think it doesn't even make it it doesn't even make it um, even. You know, it's just less awful, uh, which I honestly like because you have consistency to 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 edge in the matchup, and if you have another if you have a good hate piece uh, that they have a hard time to deal with, then you might steal some percentage points there. Um, and that's it for this week. If you enjoyed the content, please consider uh, liking this, this 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 video or wherever you're hearing this podcast. Consider subscribing to my YouTube channel where I post these and my leagues. And consider following me on Twitch where, where I'll go live every Friday. Notably next Friday, I won't go live because I won't be around. But after that, I will um, I will do my best to go live every Friday at the very least. Uh, there might be some changes to that schedule in in coming months, um, but more on that later. Anyway, thank you for tuning in and see you next time.